People are always asking me, why do I have to learn math anyways? What's the probability that the S&P will be lower over a random time period? Is that Donald Trump's chances of winning re-election based on our forecast are slightly better than the chances of getting heads twice in a row if you were flipping a coin. The confidence that the other rain will occur within our forecast area multiplied by the percent of the region that will see precipitation. And I mean, it's a great question. This shot is worth 1.5 more than this shot. If you can make it. If you can make it. If you can make it. So what happens when Houston Rockets miss 25 or 28 straight threes? Have you seen it happen since? <laughs> I have not. Well, this is pretty easy. It's just 8 out of 22,000, which turns out to be 0.036%. It's a pretty small number. How about the placebo group? Well, that's 162 out of 22,000, which is 0.74%. Sometimes I've been wondering if they have a point. It's only a 50% chance that it will rain at all. So there's a 63% chance that it's going to be higher. Roughly 33% is the average, you know, average shooting percentage of a step back three mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Now it's a little over 35%. So it's gone up two percentage points. Yeah. So the chances you have of potentially catching the disease, even if you've been double vaccinated, and we know that vaccine effectiveness is pretty high initially. 92% for Pfizer, that's the dark blue dot, and then AstraZeneca 62. But look what happens as we go forward from week one to week 20, those lines go down. After all, math is just for textbooks, right? It's just for school. It doesn't actually show up in daily life, does it? The Celtics are currently six and a half point favorites in game one, and they are minus 225 favorites to win their first championship. I mean, if you're going to be a weatherman, so for instance, on Sunday, it's a 40% chance of rain, but we're not 100% confident in that number just yet. Or nurse. So the probability that she's in the cancer group, given the test result, is 9 divided by 9 plus 89, which is approximately 1 in 11. In medical parlance, you would call this the positive predictive value of the test, or PPV, the number of true positives divided by the total number of positive test results. You can see where the name comes from. To what extent does a positive test result actually predict that you have the disease? Or a lawyer. Sally Clark was convicted of murder, and she was given a mandatory life sentence. Newspapers reported that she was guilty of killing her babies. Her appeal was dismissed because the court claimed the statistical errors were, quote, incapable of affecting the safety of the convictions. But the Royal Statistical Society blasted Meadow and the court for butchering such basic math, a real-life math mistake that ended up actually making a murderer. Or a gamer. Other games use cards, another familiar, real-world favorite. Cards are interesting because where dice feature independent probability, i.e. each throw of the die has zero impact on the next one, cards can have dependent probability, i.e. by drawing a card and removing it from the deck, you've now changed the makeup of the deck and impacted the probability of the next draw. It's the latter that makes it possible to rack up ridiculously fun synergies in Slay the Spire. Or a psychologist. So there'll be tables of descriptive statistics, so maybe mean scores and ranges. Relevant graphs are used to help the reader interpret the data visually. There'll also be a calculation used in an appropriate statistical test to show the results are significant. Or an athlete. It's a good shot. I can't wrap my head around it or so many other things for that matter, it's not like you're really gonna come across it, right? Right. You like those odds? I don't like those odds. So if you're curious or interested enough to delve into the world of probability a bit, we can start with two basic frameworks to help us understand it at a high level, theoretical and empirical. Theoretical being like in theory versus empirical being like observational. So to oversimplify a bit, something we can think about versus something we can observe. Starting with empirical, say we had a bucket of wiffle balls. Some of them are orange, some of them are white, and we don't necessarily know how many of each. We might ask a question like, what is the likelihood or what is the probability that if we reach our hand in and select a ball at random, that it will be orange? Well, what an empirical approach would tell us to do is to actually observe it. Let's start reaching our hand in and plucking out wiffle balls. And we'll keep track of how many are orange versus how many are white. We'll go 10 draws to start. So we get orange, orange, white, orange, orange, white, 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 orange, white. Okay, so that's five orange draws and five white draws. The empirical probability would be the number of times the given event occurred, in this case, drawing orange, divided by the total number of occurrences, in this case, the total number of draws. This is also sometimes called the relative frequency of the event. That means, so far, our probability of drawing orange would be five draws of orange divided by 10 total draws, so five out of 10, or if we simplify, one half. Now, let's briefly note a few things here. First, the result is a fraction. You'll often hear probabilities expressed as percents, like a lot of those clips from the beginning of this video. This is because it can sometimes make communication about them feel a bit more intuitive. But importantly, the value of the probability is always the fraction. Like if we had, say, a probability of 1,009 divided by 3,463. You might choose to communicate that this is roughly 30% because that feels a bit more familiar and much quicker to get a good sense of the quantity, but the probability itself would still be the fraction 1009 divided by 3463. More specifically, probabilities always live between zero and one. Consider the minimum. 
If we drew 10 wiffle balls and every single one of them was white, well, we would have an empirical probability of zero orange draws divided by 10 total draws. So zero out of 10 or just simply zero. It couldn't ever be less than zero because that would require a negative and number of occurrences can't really be a negative quantity. You can't draw negative three orange wiffle balls, for instance. So because both the values in our fraction must be zero or positive, then zero is the minimum for a probability. On the other hand, a probability of one must be the maximum. If we drew 10 balls and all 10 of them were orange, we'd have 10 orange draws divided by 10 total draws, or 10 out of 10, which just equals one. In order to go above one, the numerator would need to be larger than the denominator, but the number of orange draws couldn't ever exceed the number of total draws. So that sets our max. To summarize, the probability must be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. And although sometimes communicated using percentages, it's specifically the fraction of the number of occurrences of a given event divided by the total number of occurrences. Okay, so we got one half as our empirical probability for drawing an orange ball, but what you might be wondering is what would have happened if things had turned out a little differently? I mean, think about your experiences with things like drawing a card from a deck or rolling a die. They don't happen in the same way every time. Maybe when I draw 10, I get five oranges, but maybe when you come and draw 10, you only get four. Or maybe if I drew another 10 times, I'd even get as high as eight. So that's kind of the thing, right? If we're talking about observations and specifically a relatively small number of observations like 10, it's pretty likely that we might all observe slightly different outcomes and therefore compute slightly different empirical probabilities. Now, that can be a pretty big topic of discussion for both mathematics and even philosophy, but hold on to that for a moment because it brings us to the other framework, theoretical probability. In our last example, we didn't know how many of each color were in the bucket, but what if we took a look behind the curtain to see exactly how many there are? Well, this gives us an entirely new framework to view probability. In this case, we can observe 10 total wiffle balls, seven of which are orange, three of which are white. In other words, if each ball is equally likely to be drawn, we could say that there is a seven out of 10 chance to draw an orange, and that represents our theoretical probability. More specifically, where empirical probability deals with frequency of observations, theoretical probability deals with frequency of options. So theoretical probability is the number of options for an event divided by the total number of options. Here, there are seven options for drawing an orange ball and 10 total options, so the probability is seven out of 10. One thing worth noting here, especially if you're reading more about this in a textbook or a similar resource, is that the total number of options is typically called the sample space, which is just a fancy way of saying the set of all possible outcomes for a circumstance like drawing a ball or rolling a die. You may also notice this value is a bit different from what we observe when determining our empirical probability. And this is where we can come back to our question about observations using small sample sizes and what to make of different people observing different probabilities. Let's see what happens when we draw a few more. And actually, let's write a little script that tracks the observed probability after each draw and plots it out on a nice little chart. The x-axis will represent the number of draws and the y-axis will represent the observed probability of drawing orange. So what do we see when we take a look at this graph? When we started, we had a major discrepancy between what we observed and what we computed to be our theoretical probability, right? In our initial 10 draws, it was five out of 10 versus seven out of 10. But as we move to the right along this graph, as we took more and more draws, you can see that it starts to, to kind of level out and get pretty consistent. In fact, it converges to a very specific value. Can you take a guess what that value might be? Well, for reference, if we plot a line to represent where our theoretical probability lies, the seven out of 10, we can see the points converge to that line. In other words, over time, with more and more draws, the probability that we observe, the empirical probability, gets closer and closer to the theoretical probability. So yes, with small samples, we might observe different results, 
but with enough data and a large enough sample, our results start to look a lot more consistent. This is typically referred to as the law of large numbers and means exactly what we just observed. With more and more observations, the empirical probability will approach the theoretical probability. I'd be curious, now that you've got a flavor for what probability really is and how to compute it, when have you come across it in your life outside of just reading it in a textbook or listening to it in a classroom? Please feel free and welcome to share those experiences in the comments below if you'd like to, or just reflect on it to yourself personally the next time you come across it out in the real world. Either way, I hope you found this video helpful and have a great rest of your day.